last week and this past weekend and went to uh, the Raleigh-Durham area researching and trying to find a place that we knew our girls would be safe. Uh, they're both moving up there next month. Uh, we were able to get them a place to stay this past week and uh, uh, got them settled in, went and did on the orientation for Christian for her school and got Kelsey settled in. She's already met with her school people and so went to a church to try to find them a good church home Sunday. And uh, I tell you what, I, you know, sometimes it would be easy to uh, uh, get down on the church. But then when you just go in and visit and, and you don't have any responsibilities and you go into a church that's about three, four hundred people uh, and you walk in on a Sunday morning, you're thinking they're going to go through the motions. That's not at all what happened at this church. And uh, we walked in, they had one song, and they went straight into intercession for their loved ones that were lost, their community folks, their co-workers, and they prayed. I, and listen, when I say prayed, they prayed for well over an hour, weeping in the altar for their loved ones that were lost. And uh, I just thank God. It's, it's encouraging uh, to know that there's still people out there that's going after Jesus. And uh, so that, that was very encouraging to me. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to have to be honest with you. I had to go back and rewatch the video to make sure I knew where we left off last time because it's been almost a month since we've had Bible study with me anyway. I appreciate uh, Jim taking care of Bible study last Wednesday night, and I appreciate Michael uh, taking care of the services on Sunday. And uh, we're going to get back in the saddle and, and see what the Lord's going to do. Uh, I, it's been so long, my wife's going to have to refresh my memory with the prayer list. Uh, it, it's probably changed times over since, since the last time I was in service. But... Uh, I do thank you for uh, understanding, and uh, we do covet your prayers for this transition uh, that we're about to go through because uh, it, it's, it's, it's one thing to send one off, but when both of them are leaving at the same time and they're going to be so far away, uh, you probably, probably need to pray more for Tracy uh, than, than me because she homeschooled all those years and, and was with them every day, and uh, that, that's going to be tough. Look, folks, they're not just leaving. They're taking the dogs with them. I mean, when we say we're going to eat the nest, it, 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 we don't even go have a dog to greet us at the door. So uh, I, I have a feeling I, a dog's in, another dog's in our future. So, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. It's all good. Listen, we lay in the bed now. She, she's preparing because we lay in the bed at night, and, and she'll bump me every now and then and reach over with the phone and say, look at this puppy. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's only $1,200. I like the way you say that. It don't hurt when you don't say it so fast. <laughs> you know, but uh, anyway, she, she's she's uh, shopping right now. It's just a dog, Peggy. Oh, oh, I thought maybe Mike done done something to you. Mike, look, Cantrell, don't be making her mad. All right, get on over there. There you go, the lovebirds. All right, I better get started because the people online are like, "What in the world's he doing?" I just missed y'all. I... It's good to be back, I'm telling you. All right. Y'all, people moving around on me, I, 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 I think y'all just trying to mess with me a little bit, but that's all right. It's all right. So, uh, senior event going on Saturday here at the church uh, at 6 o'clock. Uh, I'm sure there's probably a, uh, a sign-up sheet at the welcome desk, and uh, if you got any questions about that, you can see Jim. Uh, ladies Fellowship, uh, that will be next Tuesday. Uh, this coming Tuesday, rather, uh, here at the church at 6.30. I'm sure Paula has a sign-up sheet out there for that also. Uh, fifth Sunday singing is coming up the uh, 29th of July, which is a couple of weeks. No, it's a week from Sunday, isn't it? Man, that means the end of July. <laughs> so is our plan to do what we talked about, or are we going to announce that later, Trace? Huh? We're going to wait? Oh, okay. We're, we're planning to do a little going away thing for the girls, and uh, we may do it that night, but we'll let you know. It'd be a good night to do it because it's music emphasis, and they're highly involved in our music program, so we may do that that Sunday night. We, we're not, that's not all not nailed down yet, but just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, we, may, we may do that on that Sunday night. But anyway, if you want to participate in the singing, uh, make sure to see Kelsey uh, by Sunday. So that or Sunday or next Wednesday, so she can put all that together. Um, but I thought Brother Wade was raising his hand, like I'm gonna sing. You gonna sing, Brother Wade? Are you just? I thought you was about to raise your hand. We was talking about singing. I, <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. 
<laughs> I just saw your hand about to go. I was like, yeah, Brother Wade's signing up. <laughs> All right. What else we got, both? Prayer requests. So I, I, I don't know any updates on most of these folks, so uh, I've just kind of been out of the loop. But um, we just uh, continue to pray for these. Uh, Tony, uh, I, I'm assuming he's still going to undergo his treatment. Uh, Kim, is, how's she doing, Sister Jen? She's actually doing better. Okay, so we're going to continue to pray the Lord to continue to touch her. Uh, Sister Brenda had her, uh, no, that's coming up, uh, coming up, the colonoscopy, endoscopy, uh, I believe it's uh, Friday. So remember her, uh, Ronnie, going through his treatments? Okay, Sheila's going through her treatments? All right, all right. So continue to remember Ronnie and Sheila. Uh, Odell Hester, who's dealing with cancer. Uh, Jody Wade, the last update I got on her, uh, they had her intensive care. She was dealing with some infection. And um, uh, that was the last I heard. That was about uh, four or five days ago that they told me what was going on with her. So we want to continue to hold her up in prayer. I'm, I'm sure she's nowhere out of the woods yet. Uh, you just don't have five organs at one time and, and uh, just get up and go back home. It, it's it's got to be tough. So remember her, if you will. Uh, George Fisher, this is uh, Tab's biological dad. Uh, praying for him. For those of you that got the phone tree, uh, he is uh, uh, under some mental evaluation for some uh, drugs that he had taken. They're not sure. I, I don't. I don't know if they've determined if it was prescription drugs or yet not. I'm, or not yet. I'm not sure. It was prescription drugs. So uh, we're just praying for George that God would touch and minister to him. Uh, Christy Griffin. Um, pray the Lord touch her. Continue to pray for Libby. Uh, Sister Voris, last I spoke with her, she's at home recovering, uh, but still needs a touch from the Lord. Uh, praying for Miranda to be completely whole. Uh, Riley Black uh, is in the midst of a, a custody battle, so remember this situation. Uh, Vanessa Lewis dealing with breast cancer. Uh, Kerrigan uh, is at home recovering, right? Huh? She's at home recovering, so uh, she had her wisdom teeth taken out today. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Graham. Uh, little Graham, uh, uh, I'm not sure how much of that's been shared, but he had to have a, a, an evaluation done on where he's at as far as his uh, age and, and, his, and his capacity as far as where he's coming along his acceleration and stuff, and he's behind. Uh, so they're going to be doing some therapy with Graham uh, to try to bring him up to, to speed. So remember that situation that God would touch him and minister to him. And then uh, Wesley Mace, uh, this is Tabitha's brother, is going to be having uh, his colon removed on Friday. So remember Wesley, if you will, uh, that God would touch him and minister to him. A lot going on. A lot going on. So uh, we just know God's able and he's faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Wow. All right. So remember, remember Libby, that God would touch her and minister her. We know God's able. We know God's able. Let's pray, and we're going to jump right back into Revelation chapter 11. Uh, we got through the first couple of verses last time, and uh, we're going to pick up with the third verse tonight and uh, talking about the uh, two witnesses, uh, the ministry of the two witnesses uh, that are spoken of in the book of Revelation. So let's, uh, let's pray over the needs and requests, pray over this time of the word, and uh, just remember one another, and uh, let's get right to it. Father, we love you so much. Thank you again for the opportunity that you've given us to come to your house. God, we praise your holy name. I ask you, Lamb of God, that you would have your way in this time of gathering, and all this time of fellowship, the time of your word. For all those that are teaching across the building tonight, I pray, God, that you would uh, minister uh, to them and through them and the particular groups that they're speaking to. I pray that your anointing would rest on them, God, and that lives would be changed and impacted for your glory and for your kingdom. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to, to be together. Thank you, Lord, that in these last days, your word has declared that we should gather even the more so as we see that day approaching. And I believe, Lord, with all that we see going on in the world, uh, God, that, that, that we're there. Uh, I believe at any moment, that the trumpet of God could sound and you could call your children home. And I just pray, God, that you help us all to be found rapture ready. If there is anything in our lives, God, that is not pleasing to you, I pray, God, that you would forgive us and cleanse us and convict us and help us to realize the error of our ways, God, and that we would change and, and, and align ourselves with your word and with your promises and, and live our lives accordingly, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for every need on our list. God, you've heard them mentioned. You've heard uh, them made known. And we're just praying, God, for healing and deliverance and, and, and direction. 
And God, that you would just move in a mighty way. God, that you would go ahead and do the work, God, that you can do as our great physician. God, as our counselor, as our high priest, God, we just pray that you would have your way in every life of every need on this list, I pray in the name of Jesus. For every person that's in this room tonight, God, whatever may be represented in their home, uh, on their job, uh, God, in their families, with their children, with their spouses, with their loved ones, I pray, God, that you would have your way in Jesus' name. God, bring restoration, bring healing, bring deliverance, I pray, in the name of Jesus, Father. We're believing you for that tonight. God, I pray as if we even prayed this past Sunday, God, and we interceded and, and, and pleaded with you for our loved ones that are lost, that they be saved. I pray, God, that you would touch our loved ones that are lost, that they would come to know you. I, Lord, I, I, I don't know that we are, are praying out of line sometimes that we're praying for physical healing when they're on the way to hell. God, it doesn't matter. The Scripture declares that it, it would be better to go into heaven maimed than it would to be going to hell whole. And I just pray, God, that you'd help our loved ones to come to know you fuller, deeper, richer. And God, just to live their lives in a way that brings glory and honor to you. I thank you, Father, again for this opportunity. I pray, Lord, as we go through the, you know, the notes for the next few moments, I pray, God, that you would be glorified. In all that we do and all that we say, we surrender it to you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Revelations chapter 11. Let's begin with verse 3. Verse 3. And he's speaking of the witnesses here. And the Bible says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So the one, Jesus, who is telling John this is the same angel that we saw last conversing with him. And, and again, he's none other than Jesus Christ. So, so Jesus is speaking to John, and these two witnesses are the witnesses of Christ. So, so these two witnesses are given power, the Scripture says, are given power to be witnesses for 1,260 days, and, or, or three and one-half years. And so these witnesses appear during the last half of the seven-year tribulation week. We see it in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. My, my wife is pulling double duty back there so i'll give her a moment here daniel chapter 9 verse 27 he says then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even till the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate so we understand that in that first three and a half years of tribulation we talked about this but just kind of refresh it that first three and a half years of tribulation there'll be peace there'll be there'll be prosperity there'll, there'll, there, it'll be a good time but that that transition point of the middle of that tribulation period. Everything turns. He break, the, the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel. The, the destruction begins to take place and God sends these two witnesses in that are going to have the power to prophesy, have the power to, to, to do the works of God in that last portion of the tribulation period. And so we see all this that's taking place. In Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 and 12. Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 and 12. It's been a long time, folks. It's all right. You don't see it? We'll keep going. So, so we, we see that in these scriptures that is called the times of the Gentiles. And we, we, we talked about that several weeks ago in Revelations 11, 1 and 2. That this particular time was the time that God was going to allow the Gentiles to have some dominion, if you will. They're, they're going to trample down the outer court, uh, in the temple reign. They're going to, they're going to trample all this down. They're going to, they're going to have some dominion, if you will. And all this is a part of what's prophesied in Matthew chapter 24, where it talks about the abomination of the desolation. All this stuff that's happening and these things that are going on it, it, this he said when you see this that was spoken of standing in the whole place let him we want you to have understanding well the good news is is the church won't be here so we don't have to worry about seeing and understanding this but this is warning to those who are left behind after the rapture of the church that if you see this then i want you to have understanding now, now I, one of my last points that i made a few weeks ago was this is that the book of Revelation scares a lot of people because there's a lot of allegory, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of things that are pictures, if you will, word pictures, a lot of allegory that God puts in there that, that may mean something in that particular season, but, but in this particular season, it, it, it begins to get more and more. But we're living in the day and age where Daniel said that in the last days, knowledge would increase. And I believe that's where we're at. Not just with technology, not just with some of the things of the world, but I believe there are more and more people that are becoming more and more familiar with what the scriptures 
says. There are more things that are making sense, if you will. When you watch the news, there are a lot of things in this Word that are coming to pass, and they're making more and more sense to us. But as we as we didn't maybe understand it much 10, 15 years ago, now some of the things that are happening, it's like, oh, man, that's what's happening right before us. And that's encouraging to us as the church to continue pressing on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling, that we can move into that place that God is calling us to so that we can see the fulfillment of His Word taking place in our life. So he says, when you see these things, we want you to have understanding. So so we see this it, from the beginning that the, these things are going to happen. So the, it's the time of the Gentiles. It said in Revelation 11 and 3 that they sat there in power and they did this in sackcloth. Sackcloth is a symbol of mourning, but it's also a symbol of judgment. It's a symbol of mourning, but it's also a symbol of judgment. In Matthew 24, verse 21, it says that this, this, there, there's going to be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. So when this tribulation, Jesus is prophesying, when this tribulation takes place, it's going to be unlike anything humanity has ever seen. Think about that for just a moment. I mean, I don't have time to go through it, but you could just go through history. Even modern history. I mean, you could go back just to 9-11 and the impact of what happened on 9-11, the impact that it had, not just on America, but the entire world. And you think about that tragedy, how it seemed like for a, a matter of weeks that all the world stood still to see the response, to see what was going to happen, to see what was going to transpire. And yet, the Bible said that when this tribulation takes place, that it's going to be like any, unlike anything that's ever happened in all of history. I mean, you, you go back into some of the dark ages and you go back into some of the times of, of slaughter. I mean, you think even now in modern history, some of the slaughter like taking place in Darfur and some of these other places where hundreds of thousands of people are being killed by their own dictators in their countries. And yet this tribulation... It's going to be like, unlike anything that's ever been seen from the beginning of the world until this time. And when it happens, it's going to be so catastrophic that it's going to far exceed anything that ever has been or ever will be. But thank God I ain't got to be a part of that. So, so we see these two witnesses. We see these witnesses of Christ. They're given power to witness. They're, they're, they're here to, to listen. This is what I believe. I believe judgment is redemptive in nature. I believe that what happens in that last three and a half years is God's judgment, but yet it's also God's mercy because He's going to send His witnesses in to continue to be a, a witness and a testimony of His power and also of His grace. I, I, I believe that through that time period that there's going to be people, because we even see it bear out in Scripture, that there are going to be people that turn to God in that time. That there are going to be people that, that, that surrender their life to God. We know that there's going to be people that are going to be sealed during that time by God because of His grace and mercy. So, so we know that there are going to be people that come out. So even in God's judgment, God still sends His Word. And remember what the Scripture said. He said, and He sent His Word and it healed them. So these folks, these witnesses of God's power are going to be very active in that last three and a half years so the antichrist is going to have the power and dominion to do what he wants to do but God's still going to have some people that are going to be working on his behalf even in the midst of that time don't ever get discouraged when you begin to see bad things happening because God is still at work. Don't ever get discouraged when it seems like everything's turned upside down and seems like everything's breaking down because God is still at work. There are people that are saying that God's going to step away from seven years and He's not going to have anything to do with the world. No, God's hand is still going to be gone. His sovereignty is still going to be in action in what's taking place even during that seven-year tribulation. He's going to be directing it all. And so this, this judgment that's coming, I always believe that judgment, I said this a moment ago, judgment is redemptive in nature. The Bible said that those whom the Lord loves, He chastens. You can look at chastening as a form of judgment. As parents, and most of us stay in here are parents, as parents, we, we discipline our children in whatever manner we did because we love them. We, we're, we're, we were teaching them not to go certain directions. God the Father does the same thing for His children. 
He sends judgment. He sends discipline to us to help us to stay in line where we're supposed to be. But He does it because He loves us. The judgment that God's sending is redemptive. He, he's trying to get people's attention to say, hey, it's one last plea to turn to me. And if you'll turn to me, I'll save you. So, so we see that these two, these two witnesses that God is going to use them. In Revelation 11 verse 4, John was told that there are two olive trees and two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. These witnesses are two olive trees, two lampstands, Standing before the God of the earth. Zechariah said concerning these two olive trees and two uh, uh, candlesticks in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 3. He says, two olive trees are by one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. Can we go to verse 11 through 14 in Zechariah? He said, then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pots from which, are, which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. And so, so, uh, so he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. So Zechariah is prophesying that God send his witnesses into the temple and they're going to be there as testimonies of God's power. Testimonies of God's power. And so Zechariah is talking about them. The, these anointed ones, they stand before God for a purpose. They're actually instruments of restoration. Last week, or not last week, last lesson, we talked about how Ezekiel saw the temple and that he was sent out with a reed to measure the temple. And, and then John measures the temple. The, the, the reasoning for the measuring is, is so that God has the exact numbers to restore that which is destroyed. See, the Antichrist is going to set up his desolation. The Gentiles are going to trample them out of court. And so we see all this destruction that's taking place, but God's taking record because he's going to restore. Remember, <laughs> the, the thing that you got to remember is, is no matter how bad the destruction, I said this last time, no matter how bad the destruction, there's always going to be a foundation. God always has the ability to rebuild. I mean, you can go back through all the biblical history and you'll see time and time again that God would raise up people like Nehemiah to rebuild and to restore. And all through the destruction, there's always been opportunity where people would come in to Israel and destroy the temple and destroy Jerusalem. They, 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 would, they would cause great destruction and great havoc, but yet God would send somebody back in with a burden to rebuild. That's why I believe Jesus could look at Peter and say, upon this rock, this foundation, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you what you're a part of is not a building. What you're a part of is not stones stacked up but what you're a part of is a heavenly entity called the church that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone and the foundation and he's the one that we're built on they tried to kill him they put him in the ground but just like he said on the third day he got back up and he's the one that we stand on it's on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is seeking sand thank God for the foundation of Jesus Christ he has these witnesses who are instruments of restoration. And when Israel was about to cross the Jordan, God was called the Lord of all the earth. Joshua chapter 3, verse 11 through 13. He said, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Look what he's saying now. Go back just one moment. So he's identified with this ark of the covenant that it belongs to the Lord of all the earth. So he's crossing over before you into the Jordan. Keep going now. Verse 12. Now therefore take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from the upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. So, so we see here in the book of Joshua that J Joshua identifies, that God identifies himself as the Lord of all the earth. So in, in, in Revelation 11 and 4, it identifies these two witnesses as olive trees, as lampstands that stand before the God of all the earth. 
So Joshua identifies him as the Lord of all the earth. And now the witnesses are acknowledging him as the Lord of all the earth. So he's in control. He, he's the one that's, that's doing these. These two anointed ones are standing before him. In his presence, they're servants of a king. See, you've got to understand that the king has these folks that are at his beckoning call. If he says, and, and we understand this uh, from, from Jairus when he was speaking to Jesus, uh, that, 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 he, that he was told, listen, you, you know, I speak to some and they come and I speak to others and they go. I understand authority. So the king has those that, that are in places of authority. And if he says go, they go. If he says another one come, they come. So these witnesses are standing before the God of all the earth. It's almost as they're saying, yes, Lord, I'm ready. Yes, Lord, I'm, I, I'll do what you're calling me to do. Yes, Lord, I'll serve you in whatever capacity you call me to serve. God, whatever you need me to do, I stand before you ready, anointed to do the work that you're calling me to do. These seven golden candlesticks, which represent the church, the Revelation 1 and 20, they're gone from the temple. Why? Because the church has been raptured. The church has been raptured. Remember the last part of this verse, the seven lampstands which you saw, there are the seven churches. And so by this time, the lampstands are not a part of the temple. Why? Because they've been removed. They've been taken away. They've been caught up. Uh, you know, people argue all the time from theology. They say, well, you know, rapture never occurs in, in the Scripture. That word's not in there. I know it's not. But, but the Bible says that the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, and we which are alive remain shall be caught up together to be with the air. What's that caught up mean? That caught up means that we're going to be raptured. We're going to be taken away. Listen, folks, we can argue about linguistics all you want, but this is what I know and this is what I believe, that soon and very soon the trumpet of God is going to sound, and the people of God are going to arise. The dead are going to rise first, and we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up. We're going to be raptured that we can be with the Lord forevermore. Thank the Lord that we're going, to home, going home to be with Him. So the church has been raptured. These two olive trees, these two candlesticks are left to give the world an anointed witness, a, a gospel light during this dark hour of tribulation. It's going to be dark, folks. And again, thank God I'm not going to be here. <laughs> but it's going to be dark. But God in His redemptive mercy is still going to have His message and His witnesses to be a part of what's going on. So there's power with these two witnesses. Revelations 11, verse 5 and 6. They, they hold the power of temporal judgment against their enemy. Verse 5 says, If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. Look at this power. Look what's happening here. These witnesses are giving power that if anybody tries to do them harm, they just blow fire and destroy their enemies. Why? Because they're anointed by God. Now, there will be some of you that are sitting here and says, boy, I'd like to have that kind of power. <laughs> you know, I, I'd like to be able to just, and just my enemies fall. You do have that kind of anointing. You do have that kind of power. The weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. I've got the anointing of the Holy Ghost on my life. That the enemies, woo, my God can prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Though a thousand right up beside me, the thousand shall fall in my, my God, I'm telling you. I come to tell you that no matter how they rise up, no matter what words they speak, you have authority to cast down every argument and every word that's spoken against you. You have an anointing that's on your life and it's the same anointing that anoints the witnesses in that last day, that same anointing of the Holy Ghost rests on us and empowers us to be efficient for the kingdom of God. Can somebody say amen? It's been a while, folks, so pardon me if I get a little happy. This fire that proceeds from their, their mouths is probably not literal fire, but rather a word of prophecy or rebuke. See, the word is powerful enough. Now, see, a moment ago, some of y'all got carnal, and you thought, boy, I'd like to have breathe like a dragon and, and, and take some people out. But I'll tell you something. A right word spoken? Come on now. A right word spoken? If you put it in the right perspective, if you speak what God's already spoken, 
You're coming in line with what God's already spoken and you're declaring. When you speak what God's already spoken, there's power in that because God's going to back up His Word. He said, I sent my Word forth and it did not return void, but it served the purpose whereunto I sent it. I come to declare that if you'll get in line with the Word of the Lord and you'll speak and declare the Word of the Lord, you've got a fire that can flow from your mouth that will destroy your enemies. And they'll be killed in that manner. This fire... It's prophecy, it's judgment that they speak and they confound their enemies with the Word of God. See, the best thing you can do when your enemies rise up is don't retaliate. Just go ahead and speak your praise. When the enemy rises up, and they're trying to destroy you. Just go ahead and say, thank you, Jesus, that I've been found worthy to be attacked by the enemy. When the enemy rises up and they start talking about you, just go ahead and say, glory to God, I've been found worthy that the enemies are scared of me enough that he would attack my shatab. They say, I'm telling you, the enemy's going to rise up, but greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. My God, you can declare the word of the Lord. There's a fire within you. The old timers, that's the way they put it. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. And I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You wonder why I act like I act. You put your feet in the campfire and see if you won't move around a little bit. You put your foot in the fire and see if you won't move and buck and I'm telling there's something about that Holy Ghost fire. When it gets to burning deep down on the inside, something comes up out of sight of you that's so supernatural that it not only confounds your enemy, but it brings glory to God and it'll blow your own mind because God is in control. This judgment... It confounds their enemies. In verse 6, it says that they have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have the power over waters to turn into blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Think about this. This is the power of these two witnesses. This witness has such favor with God. That if they declare it's not going to rain, it won't rain. But this is not a new thing, folks. It's not a new thing. Moses had this kind of authority in Egypt. God spoke to Moses and said, go before Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, if you don't let my people go, this is what's going to come upon you. And Moses, under the authority of God, declared God's word. And just like God spoke, every plague fell right into place. Elijah had this kind of whew, this kind of power. He prophesied that it would rain and for a span of, of, of three and a half years it didn't rain until Elijah prophesied and said it's going to rain. It's not new folks. Whew. My Bible tells me that whatever I ask and believe I can have. If I can believe all things are possible. If you, listen, if you can get in line and you can declare what God's already declaring, you can have it. It can be yours. Chains will be broken. The heavens can open up. The heavens can be stopped up. Fire can flow. Why? Because you've got power and authority with the word of the Lord. Moses had this authority. Elijah had this authority. Elisha had this authority. We're not real sure whether Enoch had this authority or not, but what I do know about Enoch is he walked with God and was not for God took him. He had some kind of powerful relationship with God. So, so the Bible doesn't tell us much about him, but these two witnesses, they have authority to protect ministry, and they have authority to offer a divine ultimatum to the world before the coming of the kingdom of God. They have an authority, and their power will be worldwide in scope. Look at Revelation 11, 9 and 10. It said, Then those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put in the graves. Talking about the witnesses. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. 
So these two prophets, two men, I want to sidestep again. Because there's some of you, you feel like just because you're by yourself that nothing can be accomplished. That there's some of you thinking because we only got a handful of people here that we can't make a difference. But when the anointing of the Holy Ghost begins to flow and the power of God begins to work, listen, friend, God can raise up two men that can have an impact on the entire world. My God, listen, Jesus took 12 disciples and one of them forsook him. But yet Jesus anointed them with such power that the Bible said that the people of the world declare are not these men, those that turn the world upside down. Let me tell you friend I don't get swayed by numbers but what sways me is when I feel the power of the Holy Ghost I can link up with a brother or sister in Christ and I can put 10,000 to flight by the power of God so they've got power that's worldwide in scope so, so the main question would be or who are these two guys who are these witnesses there, there's all kind of opinions to this question and I don't know that I'm really going to answer it, but I'm going to try to give a, a good enough argument for you here. There, there's names that have been projected for consideration, like Moses and Elijah, uh, 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 Enoch, and John the Baptist. Enoch was translated, so he didn't die a physical death. Remember, the Scripture tells us that, that it's appointed unto men who wants to die, and that, that, that men must face that appointment of death. E, e, uh, Enoch did not die a physical death, or at least not one that we know as death. Uh, he represents the saints before the flood. He's the only lamp of God burning in his day. Remember when Enoch walked this earth, it was a, it was a dark world. The, the, the man had fallen and, and it was a very dark time. But, but Enoch maintained his relationship with God to the point that God said, I'm just going to get you out of that mess. It's going to happen for us. So, so, so Enoch is one to be considered. Uh, the, the argument goes that he, he's got to return to earth and suffer and die. Uh, again, Hebrews 9, 27, it, it's appointed unto men wants to die. So, so everybody has to face that appointment. And then after that, the judgment. Moses performed almost the same identical miracles in Egypt as, as the miracles are, that these two witnesses are performing. When, when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the mountain of transfiguration, Moses is one of those that appears unto to, to Jesus and found standing with Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration with Elijah. Moses is a representation of the law. He's representative of the, of the Old Testament, the law. And, and there's this disputation even between Michael the archangel and, and, and Satan in Jude chapter 9, or verse 9 rather. Uh, we see where, where, where Michael and, and, and Satan are arguing over the body of Moses. There's a, a dispute over it. Some, some reason God is protecting his body. I, I don't know what all that might mean or not mean, but, but it sounds like it's of some kind of future importance. That God's saying, Satan, you're, you're not going to mess with him. You're not going to stop my plan. <laughs> so, so Elijah, Elijah was also translated. He, he, he did not see a physical death, as, as some would say. Uh, he, he did a lot of wonders. He stopped the rain. He called fire down from heaven and, and so on. He was on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus uh, and, and Moses. He, he was the only prophet of Israel in his day. He's the one that kept the lamp of God burning in Israel. When, when Elijah uh, was translated, Elisha was there, and he cried out, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 12, he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw, he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. What happened? Elisha saw El Elijah raptured into the presence of God. He saw the chariot of fire that came down. God said in uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, he said, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So this messenger was John the Baptist who prepared the way for the Messiah, Jesus Christ. John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Matthew 17, 10 through 13. He said and his disciples, asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said to him, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke of them, of, uh, to them about John the Baptist. In uh, Luke 1, 15 through 17. Do I have that one? Yes. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Talking about John the Baptist. 
He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So, so in, in one more scripture, John 1, 19 through 23. He said, now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the ways of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So here's John, foreordained in life to do the work of being the forerunner of Jesus Christ. So the possible candidates are Moses, Elijah, Enoch, or John the Baptist, depending on how you look at it. Malachi later said in Malachi 4, 5, and 6, he said, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So Malachi is prophesying of this. Jesus said in Matthew 17, verse 11, that Elijah truly is coming first and will restore all things. So it seems to me that we could probably conclude that one of the two witnesses is going to be Elijah, that God's going to use Elijah in this capacity. It seems, though, however, that in light of the discussion given, that Moses would very well possibly be the other witness. Moses and Elijah, Elijah both appear on the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ. And the transfiguration is connected with the future of Christ's kingdom. Remember, Jesus reveals himself in the fullness of his glory on that mountain to Peter, James, and John. They're there and see him, and when they see him in his future kingdom, his glory of his future kingdom, Moses and Elijah are there. So, opinion, my opinion is, is that it would be Moses and Elijah. And I'll be honest with you, I wrestled a long time with putting Enoch in there because of his translation. But we see the representation of Moses with the law and Elijah with the prophetic word and the power of God, how that God's going to use them to continue to establish and fulfill the promises of his kingdom, which he's yet to build. This new Jerusalem, this new earth that he's about to establish. So Moses and Elijah, they're there with Christ and the future kingdom. But then, then we have an issue. The killed. Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now, <laughs> It absolutely amazes me that every time God sends a witness to the earth that the world kills them. Killed John, killed Jesus, killed Isaiah. All, all through Scripture, the people that, that God would raise up in a particular time on the earth, the world strives to kill them. But you can't kill what's already dead. Let, let, you see, some, some of us live in fear of dying, but you can't kill what's already dead. See, what are you talking about? I, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ, who's already defeated death of hell, lives in me. So you can't kill what's already died. I'm dead to this world. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to the things of this life. So you, <laughs> you can't kill, but, but they're going to try to kill them. And the scripture said that they die. But that's not the end of the story. See, it does not occur until they have delivered their witness to the world. They've been hated. They're not destroyed until this time. Why? Because God always has timing. The beast, the Bible said, ascends out of the bottomless pit, which is the Antichrist. Revelation 17, 7 and 8. He said, but the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition, and those who dwell on the earth will marvel. Talk about the Antichrist. So this Antichrist rises up and he kills these Two witnesses that God has sent to proclaim his word, demonstrate his power, and render judgment on the people that are here. So they kill them. 
So then the body, the Bible says in Revelation 11 and 8, talking about the state of the body. Their dead bodies lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. You know, I'm not saying this to be disrespectful, but the devil can be dumb sometimes. What do you mean? So he's already been defeated in this city one time by Jesus, and he's going to kill these witnesses and let them lay in the same place where the Lord was killed. Wouldn't you think that if I got beat in one place, I'm not going to go back to the same place and get my hind end whooped again? Are you with me? You know, if, if, if I'm going to suffer defeat, it's because I tried something new. But the Scripture said there's not anything new under the sun. The things that have been shall also be. So the same tactics of the enemy, the same ploys of the enemy, the same plans of the enemy, he's still trying to do the same things he did yesterday, years ago, millennial ago. He's still trying to pull the same tricks. And the sad part is, is that church folks aren't wise enough to realize that he's doing the same thing to defeat them. And they could overcome if they just realize, you've done this before, and I came out. You tried this before, and I stepped out of that. You tried to kill me, before, and I'm still here. Sometimes you got to recognize that his power is already defeated. And again, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you're already standing when he tried to kill you before. He tried to kill Jesus, laid him down three days in the grave, but he got up like he said he would. And now these, these, these disciples, these witnesses of God are, are killed and they're left to lay in the same place. Wow. Wow. So, spiritually, not literally, this city is called Sodom. It's called Egypt. It's called Sodom because of perversion. It's called Egypt because of our identity with oppression and persecution of God's people. This city is the apostate Jerusalem. It's an apostate Jerusalem. It's a Jerusalem that is turned away from God. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Said for Jerusalem stumbled and Judah has fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The look on their countenance witnesses, on their countenance witnesses against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom and they do not hide it. Woe to their soul, for they have brought evil upon themselves. Jerusalem. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 30 through 33, he said, How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? For the rock is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of cobras. What's it saying here? They've fallen. Jeremiah 23, verse 14. It says, Also I've seen a horrible thing in the prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They also strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns back from his wickedness. All of them are like Sodom to be and all her inhabitants like Gomorrah. So Jerusalem becomes this apostate city, this fallen city, spiritually, falling so far away from God and the things of God that they don't even receive the true things of God. Remember what the Scripture said, that in the last days they'll call evil good and good evil. You can get so far away and become so blinded that you don't even realize the truths of God's Word anymore. And as a pastor, I can stand and minister and tell you truth, and you'll tell me I'm out of my mind. Not you. I'm just saying you. You know what I'm saying. I've had it happen. I've had people come to me, and I give them the truth of God's Word, and they say, that's not what that is. And And... It's not that I put my spin on it. I'm just, this is what it says. There's some people that think that they can live like they want to live, do like they want to do, and still make it to heaven. Not according to this book. I, I can take you to multiple lists that says if you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I, it's, not, it's not my word. I'm just the messenger. I'm a go-between. I'm just trying to tell you truth, try to give you revelation so that your life can change. But there will be many people that will be deceived in the last day because they fall into this trap of calling evil good and good evil. So Jerusalem, 
He's likened to Egypt because of her idolatries. And, and there's several scriptures in Ezekiel 23, and I'm not going to go through those traits, but I'm, I'm going to wind it up here in just a moment. But th th these references, they reveal the spiritual character of Jerusalem at this time. They identify the city as Jerusalem. And the apostle goes on to, out, to add in that uh, Revelation 11 and 8 scripture that this is where our Lord was crucified. So the dead corpses of these two witnesses are going to lie in the street of Jerusalem for three and one half days. And the attitude of the people over their deaths is absolutely funny. The Bible says in Revelation 11 and 9 <clears throat> that from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations, they'll see their dead bodies three and a half days, and they're not allowed their dead bodies to be put in the graves. Look at their attitude. Their attitude is like, we don't care about them. No, no, no respect for the dead, no, no recourse for their lives. They don't care. This modern invention of television, it's going to be absolutely possible that by satellite TV, that all across the world, their death, their bodies laying are going to be recorded and flung all across the world. But that's not the end of the story. It's a setup, folks. It, it is absolutely a setup. So think about this for a moment. I, I've used this analogy before. But some of you were living during the time that President Kennedy was assassinated. Could you imagine... And, and, and if I'm not mistaken, it was, it was a widely televised, his, his viewing and all that stuff. Could you imagine all the people across the world watching in the rotunda of the Capitol as President Kennedy lay there, that all of a sudden while everybody's eyes was on that casket, that that casket opened up and President Kennedy sit up and say, what's going on? Could you imagine the, the revival? That could take place in this country if something like that would happen? While everybody was tuned in? Could you imagine on 9-11 with all these people watching, multi-millions of people were watching all across the world as these planes flew in? If, if by God's grace when the plane hit and the, and, and the, and the, uh, the plane hit and the, and, the, and, and the explosion took place, that all of a sudden out of the ball of that building, Walk every person that was in the building unscathed and unharmed, and they come out testifying. We don't know what happened, but we were protected. The plane wing went right by my head, but I'm still here. Could you imagine the witness and the revival that would take place with such a miracle? They're going to watch these people lay dead for three and a half days. And you know with the technology that between phones and tablets and computers, and God knows if the Lord tarries much longer, what, what's, what's going to be available? of what the people are going to see and what they're going to witness, they were going to rejoice over their death. Revelation 11 and 10 says those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. They'll make merry. They're going to sing gifts. It's going to be like Christmas time for them, folks. Why? Because these two prophets that tormented them are dead, and they're going to celebrate it. I remember when America went in and, and took Iraq, and they uh, hung Saddam Hussein, the celebration that took place in Iraq. Because of the common people. Because that this man that had done so much to them that they, they celebrated his death. You know, I, I remember when, uh, uh, what was the guy's name in Libya? When, when they went in and killed him? Gaddafi. When they killed Gaddafi, they went in and they just celebrated. They drug his body through the streets, celebrated. And, and, and it, was, it was televised for people to see. But that's the way it's going to be in this day. And you know what's sad? It's probably not going to be anything new to people because the way television is going right now, it's not going to be a strange thing to see two bodies laying dead with everything we're inundated with in these last days. Are you with me? So, so we, we, we see all this is taking place, but then they get resurrected. Revelations 11, 11 and 12. I started to stop before this, but I'm not going to leave you hanging, all right? Now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered into these witnesses. God breathes into them. They stand up on their feet, and great fear fell on all those who saw them. Could you imagine the multi-millions of people that will be watching this on television that for three and a half days these bodies lay dead, and all of a sudden they stand up and say, okay, boys, we're back. Could you imagine the fear that falls on them? Look at verse 12. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. I'll wait for that to sink in for just a moment. 
So they're going to be dead three and a half days. They're going to stand up, and all of a sudden God's going to say, come on up here, boys. And they're going to be standing there going, what in the world just happened? They're going to turn to their scientists. Can you explain it? I don't know what the world happened there. They're going to turn to their theologians. Can you tell us why? I don't know what the world happened there. All I know is I go back to Revelation 11, and God spoke some 2,000 years ago on the island of Patmos to a man named John that this was going to happen, and God's bringing his word to pass. Listen, friend, I don't care where it was uttered. I don't care in whose ear it was heard, but I do know this. If God has spoken it, it will come to pass. If God has declared it in his word, just like every John and every tittle, every dot of an eye, every cross of a T. God will bring His Word to pass. All you got to do is trust Him. Trust Him. And God's going to do what He said He would do. Trust Him. Watch God bring it to pass. He raises them up. The Spirit of life, the breath of God, enters their body, and multitudes are going to hear it, and they're going to stand up. Listen, it's very likely that not for long from now, we're going to hear the same words. Dead, get up. Graves are going to bust open. You know, when I do a funeral, I sit in amazement and look at all the protocol they go through to, to accomplish government regulations, to properly put a body in the ground, and all the processes that they go through. First of all, they take that body and they suck all the blood out of it and embalm it and, and put it in that box. And then when they put it in that box, they shut that lid and they got a crank. If you've never seen it, they got a crank that looks and, and it looks like an old crank from an old old car that you used to crank up. And they crank that thing down and seal it and get it all good and secure. Then they take it, and depending on what kind of box you want, now they got them made out of plastic. But they, they, they put you in that box and they seal that down. And then they put you six feet in the ground and they cover you over with dirt. So they do everything they can to make sure that that body is secure. But I don't care what they do. With one blast of the trumpet, the seal's got to break. The top's going to come off. The six feet of dirt's going to open up. And the dead in Christ are going to rise up. But that's not the end of the story. Because then when they get risen, all of a sudden they're going to be caught up in the air. And the Bible said God's going to speak, come up here. And we're going to be caught up together to be with them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Oh, listen, friend. They're going to see it on that day. They're going to see it on the day the witnesses get up. And there's going to be some people that have denied this gospel that we've witnessed to and talked to. And they're going to look one day and I'm going to be gone. They're going to say, I remember when he talked about it and now he's gone. I remember when he preached about it about it and now he's gone the witness of God is going to come to pass just like it did with the witnesses here God's going to say y'all come on up here Whew, I can't wait for that to happen let me finish real quick Revelations 11 and 13 there's results of their re resurrection the Bible said when they were resurrected that the same hour there was an earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid. And guess what they did? They gave glory to the God of heaven. In other words, I believe there's going to be some people that come to their senses, and they say, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> Somebody should have shouted right there. Because might be some of your loved ones that say, I've tried to resist this gospel long enough. After what I saw, I'm going to fall on my knee and I'm going to declare the goodness of God. Listen, friend, there is coming a day that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that my Jesus Christ is Lord. Listen, on that day, they're going to, the rest of them, look, 7,000 killed, but the rest of them are going to fall on their knee and give glory to the God of heaven. Listen, friend, I'm telling you, it's coming to pass. They will know that our God is God. They fall in repentance. For some of them, it might be an emotional moment, sort of like what we saw at 9-11, that they, it's not genuine repentance, it's just an emotional repentance, that they go through the motions and do it because of a fearful moment. But then maybe that'll wear off. But they'll know one day. They'll one day. The people who would not allow the burial of these two witnesses now see 7,000 of their own people buried alive in a falling of the city and in their houses and their businesses and ultimately in hell because they fell in the judgment of God. Revelation 11 and 14, last verse. The Bible said the second woe is past and behold the third woe is coming quickly. Remember, each woe, there's three woes, each woe becomes more and more intense. 
Folks, you read this right here and you see all the things that transpire. And remember, we still got a third woe to go. The sounding of the sixth trumpet, the mighty angel with the little book, the times of the Gentiles, the ministry of these two witnesses, all of this makes up the second woe. But the third woe is coming quickly. Matter of fact, it's the very next event in Revelations 15 through 19. Let me read this to you and we'll end with this. Revelation 11, 15 through 19. The seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and you've reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. It should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant, and was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. What in the world, man? These witnesses are caught up. Judgment's about to come in even a greater measure. And all of a sudden, heaven begins to rejoice and praise and magnify the name of the Lord. Look, folks, there's one key word I want you not to miss, and I think it was in the previous verse, the 18th verse. And make sure I'm going, yep, 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 right there. He said they're going to reward the prophets and the saints. We're going to be there, folks. For all those people that think we've got to get through tribulation before the church is raptured out, we're going to be there. We're going to be there and enjoying the, praise, the presence of God. We're going to be enjoying the, the, the glory and the grace of God. We're going to be enjoying the mercy of God. We're going to be there. Thank God I'm going to be there. I read this stuff, and it absolutely blows my mind how some people are so hardened and so blinded to go and live in the things of this world and turn from the things of God. When God's telling you, this is what's going to happen, get ready, it's going to happen. It absolutely confounds me, confounds me, that there have been people that have tasted and saw that the Lord is good and still turn and go back to the things of the world. It blows my mind to think that there are people that are doing that. But there's a reward if you'll just keep hanging on. So let me leave you with a word of encouragement. Don't give up. Don't turn around. Don't give in. Hold on. Your redemption is nearer than when you first believed. Keep pressing on. Keep going forward. Don't you let the devil lie to you. Remember the same tactics he's tried to destroy you with before. He's using them again. And you just go ahead and get wise to it and rest in God. Rest in his word. Rest in his promises. And know that God's going to fulfill what he said he would do. Can you say amen? Amen. Would you stand with me just a moment? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your glory. Thank you, God, that you're in control. For every person that's been here tonight or maybe watched online, I pray, God, that you would encourage them to keep pressing on to the mark of the prize of the high calling. It's, it's hard. God, just the other day, I reminded somebody not to give up because when you're facing the resistance, you're usually going in the right direction. God, I told, I, I told that person, and I will tell the folks that are here tonight, even in prayer, don't give up. Don't ever give up. For what we have coming the Bible said that the sufferings of this present day are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I believe it's coming soon. Help us, God, to hold on. Help us to be faithful. Help us to endure to the end that we might be saved. I give you all the praise, the glory, the honor. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice of Jesus that I might have eternal life. Thank you, Lord. Can we just lift our hands and thank him that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for sacrificing your life and laying it down for me and calling me a friend. Thank you, Jesus. I love you tonight. I give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. And all of God's people say, amen. amen. God bless you. God bless you. I tell you what, I keep feeling good like this. I might take a week off every now and then. God bless you guys.